Uh, my name's Jim. My pronouns are he, him. I'm an at-large member of the Denver Communists coming to you from unseated uh, Darug and Garingai uh, country here in Sydney, Australia. And we are here to talk about May of 1968 in France, uh, which was a series of events so big that you can just say May of 68 and people will know what you mean. Um, and uh, so how do you explain, uh, let's see, there we go. Sorry. How do you explain May of 68 uh, uh, to someone who doesn't know about it? Um, picture something as vast and exciting and overwhelming as the George Floyd rebellion was for us, the way that movement touched every aspect of our society, political, cultural, you name it, and especially for the way it evolved so quickly, like how we were so shocked to look back after even a week and see how much had happened in a short time, uh, much less a month. Um, but May of 68 was far more disruptive, especially because it actually involved a general strike. Um, it was one of the biggest general strikes in world history, um, certainly the biggest ever in an advanced in, uh, Western industrial nation, and it brought Fran France closer to the doorstep of revolution than any Western nation has come since World War II. And this was in a wealthy country that had a strong tradition of liberalism and reform. In other words, the conditions for a revolution weren't what you expect in terms of entrenched social or economic crisis or the ruling class losing its legitimacy. Um, it started out with university students protesting and fighting the police in Paris, and it quickly escalated in geometric fashion as workers all over the country became involved. At its height, there were 10 million workers on strike. They shut down the entire country and the president of France fled to West Germany. In some workplaces and in, in, a, in at least one city, uh, there was nascent revolutionary organization towards dual power. Uh, Ian Birchall, the author of the piece we're talking about today, says, in most cases, workers were not simply striking, but challenging the sacred heart of property relations by occupying their workplaces. Um, May of 68 was not only one of the most important social uprisings of its time, it also had a big impact on culture. Um, a lot of amazing... Let's see, this slideshow is not working. There we go. A lot of amazing art and literature and cinema came out of May of 68. Uh, you can make a strong case that it influenced punk rock, uh, especially via the Situationist International, which was a collective of Marxist artists and theorists who, among other things, were responsible for some of the most memorable slogans of May of 68. Um, this is the type of art they would do, like kind of disrupting literary texts. Uh, and here's some of those slogans. Um, Be realistic, demand the impossible. Uh, ne travailler jamais, or never work. And this one, which is my favorite revolutionary slogan of all time, and in fact, I named my blog after it, uh, Sur le pavé, la plage, under the paving stones, the beach. It means there's a new, more beautiful world and a more fun world waiting for us if we rip up the old world. Um, but under the paving stones is also a more literal reference to the cobblestones that French protesters have historically ripped up to make weapons or barricades. Uh, but we'll get to that part. Um, and this is just sort of a little reference to the to the uprising that's happening in France now as we speak, uh, protests against Macron's pension reforms. Um, so May of 68 has so many lessons for us. Uh, Ian Birchall says the argument that the socialist revolution is a realistic option for the coming decades in advanced capitalist countries such as Britain, West Germany, or Germany, as we call it now, <laughs> or the US must still to a considerable extent rest on the experience of France in 1968. Um, and this is in a drawing of Ian Birchall, which I just thought was nice. Uh, Birchall opens this chapter by talking about the state of the French economy in the mid sixties. He sarcastically cites an article from the economist that was coincidentally published in early May of 1968 that praised the strength of the economy there and said one advantage was that the unions were pathetically weak. Uh, there was supposedly a balance between government planning and the free market that was admired by British labor. Um, Birchall also quotes a French Marxist writer of the time, André Gors, who says, in the foreseeable future, there will be no crisis of European capitalism so drastic that it will drive the mass of workers to revolutionary general strikes. In other words, right up until the eve of this uprising, a lot of smart people, both in the mainstream and on the left, didn't see it coming. That doesn't mean it didn't happen for lots of objective reasons, but it's just a reminder that the activity of the working class is spontaneous and complicated and doesn't follow rules. In another uh, article from 2008, Birchall points out, revolutionaries do not determine events, nor do they predict them. Lenin was surprised by both 1905 and 1917. What revolutionaries can do is understand events and de develop a strategy to take advantage of them. 
So there's a really important lesson that we should not take the political terrain that we're on right now as some final unquestionable state of things. We shouldn't assume that because our economy is relatively prosperous compared to the developing world, or that unionization is low, or that most people are demobilized by electoralism, that a workers' uprising couldn't explode under the right conditions, because all of those things were true of France in early 1968. Um, okay, so now let's get into the background and the conditions that led to these events. Uh, France wasn't as rosy for workers in early 68 as the commentators made out. In the mid-60s, millions of French workers were surviving on severely low wages. Unemployment was high, and unions were indeed weak. Uh, union membership plummeted after the war from 7 million to 3 million. Big employers like Michelin, Peugeot, and Citroën either ignored or strong-armed the unions. Union leadership, or misleadership as we should call it, often used partial strikes of one day or even one hour to diffuse tensions rather than make any gains. In the summer of 1967, so less than a year before the uprising, the government had successfully attacked Social Security, reducing health care benefits, which to me it just sounds like such an echo of what France is going through right now. Um, despite all indications, there was in fact a growing wave of strike activity, sometimes militant, brewing in late 67 and early 68 in productive industries like shipbuilding and car manufacturing, but also among engineers and public sector workers. So pressure was building up and there was a lot of dissatisfaction among workers, but it wasn't immediately apparent. The president of France at this time was Charles de Gaulle. Uh, de Gaulle was a former general, a hero of the war against Nazi Germany but he was quite right-wing, albeit with a few liberal tendencies. Um, de Gaulle was brought out of retirement in 1958 to be the first president of the Fourth Republic. Basically, uh, without launching all into it, there was a mini crisis of legitimacy for the government at that time, and that had a lot to do with the bloody and unpopular colonial war in Algeria. And the ruling class shuffled the deck a little bit and came out with a new constitution with de Gaulle as the new leader because of his resume and, and his charisma. But the new regime's authoritarianism would ultimately create frustration among French students and workers. Other major players in these events, which you have to understand going in, the CGT, the Confederation Générale du Travail, uh, a massive and highly bureaucratic union confederation, the most powerful in France, that was effectively controlled by the Communist Party of France, the PCF. Now, the PCF was the strongest organization on the left, on the French left by far. It won't surprise you to learn that it was deeply Stalinist. Uh, they had been excluded from the government for 20 years, but stayed strong by being deeply embedded in the CGT union. Uh, its strategy was a re reformist strategy focused on a return to parliament and forming alliances with other parties. The reformism of the PCF became a very significant factor during the events of May. And these are some of the uh, PCF leaders at a rally in early 68. Um, I think actually on May Day, so before all of this started happening, Spoiler alert, the CGT and the PCF are the villains of this tale. Birchall's title for the next uh, section is so great, The Student Detonator. It really speaks to the importance of the student movement in triggering these events. As Birchall puts it, the explosion did not result from a simple quantitative increase in working class militancy. Instead, history took a detour through another sector of society, France's growing student population. Jason's term for this, uh, by the way, is jumping circuits. Um, as Mick Armstrong argues in From Little Things, Big Things Grow, students shouldn't be discounted politically because they're young or academic or supposedly bourgeois. The latter may have been true of uni students before World War II, when they were the social elite, they were trained to be lawyers and professors and so on, and they were pretty adjacent to the ruling class. But after the war, more students came from the working class. And I'm thinking of my own family, like the first uh, generation of people in my family who went to college was in the mid 60s. My mom and dad's generation and that's i'm sure that's true of many of us you know um and in france as in many places there was a massive increase in student population uh, it tripled from 175,000 to 530,000 just in a few years universities grew and proliferated they were welcoming more working class students in order to train more technicians and administrators for modern industry in other words these were more humble roles than those previously elite roles in the you know in the past and they were much more subject to the pressures of working class life, such as poor play or unemployment, poor pay or unemployment. This created alienation because there's a cognitive dissonance between what young people expect universities to be and what they really are under capitalism. Birchall quotes Tony Cliff on this. In the university, there is a contradiction between the ideal of unlim unlimited intellectual development, free from social, political, and ideological restraint, and the tight intellectual reins imposed by capitalism. The liberal mystique of education clashes with its social content. 
Um, and so just basically saying that students, you know, may, maybe they're in a more acute place where they can see some of these contradictions and, and they have a little bit more freedom to act on it. Um, Birchall does point out that students aren't inherently a new revolutionary vanguard, as some starry-eyed leftists of the time argued, but they can be a powerful political force under certain conditions, though, and in 1968, those conditions were in place. Um, so the Red Flag article about May of 68 by Eddie Stevenson highlights the importance of anti-imperialism to the social explosion that occurred in May. Students were among the few French leftists that protested the Algerian war in years past, in the late 50s and early 60s, to their credit and to the shame of the rest of the left. And later, like students in the US and Australia, they agitated over the Vietnam War. Their protests increased in size and militants after the North Vietnamese Tet Offensive in January of that year, which galvanized the anti-war movement worldwide. French students were also fired up about other demands, such as the right to freely circulate with students of the opposite sex. And I just want to point out that French students in the 60s had such cool fashions. So amazing to see these people, these young kids fighting the police and dressed like what looked like, you know, from a French New Wave movie or something. I just love it so much. Um, so at this point in early 68, student demonstrations and occupations basically followed one after the other as their issues were rebuffed by authorities and they became more outraged. As Birchall writes, by the beginning of May, the situation in Paris was almost out of control. On May 3rd, the authorities decided to close the Sorbonne, the research academy in Paris, one of the world's most famous universities. By the closing it, they were hoping to isolate the militants, but this was, as Birchall says, a colossal miscalculation. The student movement was stirred up even more, and there were student demonstrations every day that week, with increasing violence on the part of the cops in response. Now we arrive at the turning point on May 10th, what became known as the Night of the Barricades. I'm going to quote Birchall at length here because this part is so spine-tingling. The crunch came on the night of 10 May. Students who had been battered by the police over the preceding nights decided to stand their ground and fight. By midnight, they found themselves holding the Latin Quarter, and in order to ward off police attacks, they began to build barricades. The streets of Paris were still paved with cobbles. One, one account has it that a passing builder showed the students how to use a pneumatic drill to, to tear them up. From then on, the situation developed at great speed. Many bystanders joined the students and on the spot radio reports told others what was going on and brought them out to join in. One eyewitness rec recounts, literally thousands helped build barricades. The radio reported that more than 60 barricades were built in different streets. Women, workers, bystanders, people in pajamas, human chains to carry rocks, wood, iron. A tremendous movement had started. Our group, most have never seen the others before. We are composed of six students, 10 workers, some Italians, bystanders, and four artists who joined later. We never even knew each other's names. 100 people helped carry the stuff and pile it across the street. Witnesses say it happened all at the same time, more or less in the same way, all over the Latin Quarter. Uh, Birchall references the tradition of building barricades in Paris during previous revolutions. And it's just so cool to think of that collective memory on these same streets. Like this is the French Revolution, the Revolution of 1848, and this is the Paris Commune. And you can just see the comparisons. This is, this is May of 68. Um, and here's just more. I, there's so many cool photos of these barricades. They're just so amazing. Uh, and they would turn cars upside down. And 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 there's a, another cool shot that I don't think I got into this slideshow that it's just a whole street of upside down cars that are barricades. Um, uh, important to highlight how much brutality was exercised by the cops against the students. They clubbed people indiscriminately. They invaded people's apartments. They beat pregnant women. They used military grade chemical weapons. Uh, the Red Flag article points out the solidarity of res residents in the Latin Quarter. They sheltered wounded students. They poured water from their balconies as an anti-tear gas measure. The fierce resolve of the students and the brutality of the police helped sway public opinion the next morning. At an impasse, the government reopened the Sorbonne and ordered the release of all the students who had been arrested. I preferred to give the Sorbonne to the students than see them take it by force, said the prime minister. But these concessions showed the strength of the movement, and rather than dissipating it, they electrified it. The CGT and other unions agreed on a one-day strike in solidarity with the students, and on May 13th, a million workers marched in Paris. One eyewitness wrote, endlessly they filed past. There were whole sections of hospital personnel in white coats, some carrying posters saying, where are the missing injured? Uh, every factory, every major workplace was represented. There were numerous groups of railwaymen, postmen, printers, metro personnel, metal workers, airport workers, market men, electricians, lawyers, 
uh, and there's so many more professions they list, uh, waiters, municipal employees, shop girls, insurance clerks, road sweepers, et cetera, et cetera, row upon row of them, the flesh and blood of modern capitalist society, an unending mass, a power that could sweep everything before it if it but, if it but decided to do so. As Birchall puts it, the unions had tried to use their well-established tactic yet again, one day's action to defuse the situation, but this time it had not worked. After this glimpse of mass power, the movement had to go on. Things had taken a life, th things had taken on a life of their own. And after seeing the courage of the students and glimpsing the power of workers on May 13th, rank and file workers around France started taking their own initiative. Okay, the general strike. Um, on May 14th, workers at Sud Aviation in Nantes began an occupation of the factory. This was after months of agitation by a small handful of Trotskyists in the union there, yay team. After that, after that, occupations at workplaces started springing up all over France. These actions were often spontaneous and led by young workers and they fueled each other. It became a domino effect that eventually led to a general strike that stopped the whole country. Uh, as Birchall writes, within a fortnight, more than 9 million workers were on strike. Every sector was involved. As one, eyewitness, uh, as one eyewitness reported, on Wednesday, the undertakers went on strike. Now is not the time to die. A general strike inevitably poses the question of power, power at the level of the factory, of the society, and of the state. Bir Birchall talks about how the strike had shut the country down to the point that workers started taking control of essential services and basic functioning of society. And these are just different shots of factory occupations and like the graffiti that they would write on the walls and stuff. Uh, the Seattle general strike of 1919 reached this point too. And, and, and it's also been happening in more patchwork fashion in France this year as uh, what we call the Robin Hood strike, uh, like striking gas, power and water workers will take control of service. Uh, food supplies distributed to the families of workers by striking truck drivers, postal workers delivering only urgent messages. In some factories, workers decided what was important to produce, such as walkie-talkies for the protesters. These actions alone have a radicalizing effect on people. Um, during a revolutionary situation, you see so much creativity on the part of workers and, and intellect and hunger for knowledge, knowledge and initiative. The necessities of life normally taken for granted now appear visibly as the products of human labor, as Birchall says. He argues that they didn't go far enough. They could have really firmly taken control of the electricity grid and the media, for example, in order to directly combat the ruling class, but they held back from flexing like this. But militant feeling was still high. At said aviation, 20 managers were detained by workers for two weeks. They were locked up in offices and they could order food and call their families, but they couldn't leave. And they had to ask permission to use the bathroom. Workers voted democratically at every meeting whether to let them go or not. And by the way, I just love these photos of workers taking it easy while occupying their workplaces. Uh, so there was that militance, but in most places, union misleadership imposed their will. There were 9 million strikers, but only 3 million were union members. And this disparity led the bureaucrats, uh, let the bureaucrats keep control of the strike. There was a lot of moralizing and hierarchy on the part of the bureaucrats. They tried to prevent mass meetings and picket lines, or they simply sent non-union non -union workers home to be exposed to bourgeois TV and the press. They especially excluded revolutionary socialists and the young and the recently radicalized. In the absence of workers' councils that might have directly challenged the power of the state, what you saw in May of 68 was a lot of local action committees. These were much more informal and spontaneous than democratic, democratically elected strike committees. Uh, and this was both a strength and a weakness. Uh, they came in two broad categories, these committees, uh, practical jobs like sweeping streets, tending to the wounded and distributing food, or producing information and propaganda. A huge number of pamphlets, papers, posters, even films and photo ex exhibi uh, exhibitions were produced to educate the people. Uh, and this is a famous poster, which is actually the cover of the book we're reading. Uh, and that means we are the power, by the way. Um, by contrast, at Nantes, which is a large port city in Western France, dual power, dual power was much more of a reality. And there the movement reached its highest level, according to Birchall. For a week at the end of May, organizations uh, effectively ran the city. The police and the administration simply looked on powerlessly. And I think this is a factory in Nantes and that, that, that must be a boss or a capitalist in hung in effigy, or a couple of them, I think. Um, uh, this is Sud Aviation in Nantes. Uh, peasants and farm workers in Nantes put up roadblocks. They took control of gasoline. Farmers and workers coordinated distrib distribution of food with one result that the food prices went down because the middleman was cut out. Um, 
and uh, Here's more people chilling and having a picnic in Nantes at, at a factory there. These are farmers in the in the city square in Nantes. Those are the ones raising that sign. So, so there was a real coalition of peasants and workers there. Um, it's also important to point out that women, including housewives, played a major role in, in the takeover of Nantes. So people were radicalized quickly all over France, as, as uh, Birchall points out. Ideas and attitudes rapidly communicated from one section of the population to another. There were daily mass meetings at the Sorbonne and at the Odeon, which was the National Theater of France. This one says the Odeon is open, and that means it's open to everyone. Um, uh, young workers who were shunned by the unions would make their way to the Sorbonne and mingle with the students. Through the students, young workers got the radical education they didn't get from the Communist Party. Uh, one young worker who was part of the occupation of Renault said the union's bureaucratic approach was totalitarian while the Sorbonne represented freedom and said this was the first time they were considered human. The movement also took in other layers of society that are normally not revolutionary. The middle classes, white collar workers, religious people, athletes. Scientists went on strike at a nuclear research center over issues of who got to control their work. There was widespread questioning of hierarchies in the medical profession. Young Catholics occupied their churches, a pro football club locked up their manager. As I mentioned, there was a great cultural upheaval. Examples include the cancellation of the Cannes Film Festival. There's amazing footage of French new wave filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard, who was a Marxist in fact, and Francois Truffaut shutting down Cannes. Um, famous cultural figures such as uh, philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre and novelist Jean Genet and Marguerite Duras addressed student protesters. And here's a photo of Sartre and his partner Simone de Beauvoir, who is a highly influential feminist theorist passing out socialist newspapers during the strike. And I just love this because they must have been so stoked about all this, you know? Um, Birchall actually published a book about Sartre, so I know that the cultural aspect of all this is important to him. Uh, new cultural forms were experimented with. Fine art, film, and even television were produced by radical artists. There were all sorts of slogans that combined the cultural and the political, like it is forbidden to forbid, and all power to the imagination, which Birchall uses as the subtitle of this chapter. And I just love that kind of uh, remix of old slogans. Um, the Situationists, as I mentioned, embodied this cultural upheaval. Um, here's just some more of these brilliant posters. There's so many of them. Uh, now, uh, for the important question of how the movement included the oppressed, including immigrants and women, Birchall says, a general, strike is, uh, a general strike not only challenges the basis of capitalist exploitation, it also brings to the surface the various forms of impression, oppression inherent in society. Uh, Birchall says that immigrant workers played a big part in May of 68, for example, the big contingent of Haitians and other West Indians in the May 13th workers rally, and also in the factory occupations. Just personally, I noticed you see a lot of black and brown workers in the photos of the occupations. Um, at one point, immigrants occupied an immigration office, and among their slogans was that it represented a new slave trade. Uh, in general, Birchall says that May of 68 strengthened multi multicultural bonds among workers in France. Um, I have some questions about his approach, about Birchall's approach to this, but I'm going to get to that in the discussion. Uh, I didn't want to take too much time with it now. Uh, now, Birchall says that things were more mixed when it came to, came to women's role in the movement. France in 68 was very backwards on women's rights compared to other places. The women's liberation movement hadn't really arrived in force yet, uh, even, even compared to the UK or, or America, which were still also backwards, but France was even more. Um, Birchall says that May of 68 actually helped push it along. Uh, on the downside, there were lots of macho slogans and posturing seen at rallies, which probably wouldn't surprise us to learn. Uh, with so many young men involved, but uh, and women were even more housebound than usual during the general strike, unfortunately. But on the other hand, women were definitely involved where the struggle was at its highest. Uh, a large number of women students were on the barricades on May 10th and through and the, in the fighting throughout. And, and again, you just personally, you see them in so many of these photos. And like I mentioned, women were very involved with the takeover of the city of Nantes. Uh, now, Birchall goes out of his way to say that May of 68 wasn't immediate. Oh, and by the way, this is this is in Nantes, uh, this, this woman, uh, you know, being attacked by police. Um, he goes out of his way to say that it wasn't a revolutionary situation. Now, I, I'm not, I don't know how else you define it. Um, he, he, he says that capital still ruled and the state machine was untouched. But then he goes on to list all the ways that the establishment was under serious threat. The stakes were very high. Um, the strike had a deep economic impact. 
Banks around the world refused to deal with the franc. There were actually refugees fleeing over the border to, to Switzerland and, and um, Belgium with suitcases full of cash. Um, the government made substantial concessions in its talks with the unions, but on May 27th, the workers refused the deal and voted to continue the strike. Uh, de Gaulle called a referendum, which was made up of very vaguely worded reforms and mainly was just a referendum on his leadership, but it proved impossible to hold the referendum because striking printers wouldn't print it. The situation was edging towards confrontation with state for oppression. There were 144,000 police and 261,000 soldiers for just 9 million workers. There's no way they could have forced them all back to work. Many soldiers were conscripts with deep ties to the working class. Um, uh, discontent was widespread in the military and some of the propaganda from the movement was having its effect, just like it did in, in, with the US troops in Vietnam. There was also discontent among police unions. Now, Birchall is very careful to argue that police are not workers and those unions weren't real unions, but the point is that they would have just been unreliable in breaking the strike. Um, government leaders recognized how precarious their situation was. On May 29th, de Gaulle briefly fled to West Germany to join French troops there. If the movement had been aware of this power vacuum, it would have been a turning point, but it was all very hush-hush and the moment passed and, and uh, one of the generals there talked him back into going home and confronting the movement. The misleadership of the CGT and the PCF seriously bungled things in these late stages. Uh, PCF, remember that's the French Communist Party, spoke of the alternative between constitutional change and storming the palace, quote unquote. This was a false opposition. As Birchall says, the crucial question at this moment wasn't insurrection, but establishing strike committees of the rank and file and linking them up to regional and national committees in order to create a situation of dual power. This would have then raised questions of defense of the movement and worker-directed production. But as Birchall says, none of this was to be, for while the state was in disarray, the workers too lacked decisive leadership. The gap was filled by reformist leaders who were almost as frightened of workers' power as the ruling class. In many ways, the story of May of 1968 is the story of the betrayal of the movement by the French Communist Party. As Birchall puts it, the PCF were characterized by a combination of massive industrial power and a commitment to legality. They mainly wanted to use the events of May to build on their own status in the political establishment. And as Birchall puts it, the cost of that was stifling one of the greatest spontaneous mass movements in history. During May, the PCF leadership sought to present themselves as the only Marxist party and avoid being outflanked on their left. They actually denounced the students in the early days with vicious propaganda against them in their paper and through word of mouth. But they had to shift their tone after the May 13th rally when it became clear that the masses of workers were in solidarity with the students. After that, as Birchall puts it, the PCF felt obliged to respond to the growing wave of strikes while scrupulously refraining from actually giving a militant lead. They often spoke of unity or made bland calls for democratic union, quote unquote, whatever that means. But this masked a sectarian approach on the ground, such as how their strike committees ex excluded young revolutionaries. A massive social movement can begin spontaneously, but, but for it to realize its full potential is quite another matter. The absence of a revolutionary party able to lead a challenge to the centralized power of the state was one of the main reasons why the enormous creativity and militancy developed in May of 68 was frittered, frittered away in June. What could a revolutionary party have done? It could have drawn on the spontaneous wave of militancy and generalized from it. It could have communicated experience. It could have raised every struggle to the level of the most developed. It could have, uh, in other words, the most developed member or the most developed worker. It could have produced a centralized newspaper to counter lies of the bourgeois media, and it could have called the bluff on armed force or civil war. In other words, a revolutionary party was exactly what was needed and it was not there. Um, the revolutionary current that did exist was small, isolated, fragmented, and largely confined to student groups. Um, there were three basic tendencies, um, and they were all at odds with each other. Uh, anarchists. Um, so we're just going to briefly run through these three tendencies without getting into a lot of detail about the different factions. Uh, anarchists, uh, they had great energy and inspiration when it came to the street fighting, but they couldn't play a consistent role due to their own randomness and, and their own, you know, anarchism. And they fatally rejected the idea of a party. Uh, Maoists uh, were very dedicated in the struggle, but they had no strategy to speak of uh, other than basically volunteerism, which basically means believing that the will of a committed few can make a difference in a revolution. Trotskyists, yay team. There were three main factions that I won't get into. 
they played a key role in the street fighting and the protests again, uh, and they punched above their weight in the unions, as I mentioned, but they were too accommodating to, accommodating to the mood of the students from one day to the next. And they were basically just too small and, and, and they just you know, didn't, didn't have enough cadre to make an effect. Birchall says we, we shouldn't underestimate the revolutionary left. They accomplished a hell, a hell of a lot in a month, but there was a fatal lack of organization and strategy along with a tendency towards ultra leftism, even among the trots. On May 30th, De Gaulle addressed the nation. It was not broadcast on TV because of the strike at the public broadcaster. Nevertheless, nevertheless it was effective. Um, he canceled the referendum. He called for parliamentary elections. In other words, he dissolved parliament, which is something that happens in a parliamentary situation, a uh, parliamentary system um, that could happen here in Australia too sometimes. Uh, he also engaged in whistleblowing the right wing, calling for quote unquote civic action to counter the movement and defend France. This was a brilliant strategy on both ends. The PCF and the other reformists couldn't oppose the election, so they were caught out. And the same night of the speech, there was a right-wing nationalist protest of over 1 million people. It was ugly. There was a lot of anti-Semitism, and among the slogans was Keep Algeria French, which was a nationalist slogan from the days of the war, and a song too, I believe. De Gaulle also released a far-right general from jail and, and other members of a secret police organization, basically throwing a bone to the right wing, and he enacted a ban on revolutionary groups. The PCF didn't protest any of this. Inevitably, violence followed. There were right-wing attacks on revolutionaries in the streets with at least one murder, the result. But the PCF still focused their criticism on left-wing violence. De Gaulle began using police force to break factory occupations and riot police killed two people, a student and a young worker. The government's strategy in the following days was to com combine this show of force with concessions to workers. The concessions were real but limited and nothing like what could have been one, if the movement held strong. It they were also pretty tenuous. For example, Citroen fired 925 workers after elections were safely over. Each sector of workers negotiated with the government separately, which caused fragmentation of the movement when it came down to voting whether to continue striking or not. Now, this is where the betrayal of the CGD, CGT bureaucrats really comes into play. One worker was quoted as saying, the role of the CGT in these votes was at best confusing and at worst criminal. In some workplaces, non-strikers were allowed to vote. The CGT made a practice of falsely announcing to workers in one factory that, that others had already voted to quit the strike and thus swayed the votes. Now, I just couldn't believe it when I read that. Um, de Gaulle's strategy paid off. In the election, his party triumphed in a landslide. The PCF actually lost seats in parliament, and that, that was the beginning of its long decline after their behavior during the May of 68 because they had lost the trust of workers. And I could say it not, couldn't happen to a nicer party. Um, uh, and as Birchall writes, uh, and by the way, this poster says the vote changes nothing, the struggle continues. And I think it's uh, obviously it's referring to the vote whether to continue the strike or not, but I, I just think it's such a great slogan in general about electoralism. Um, Birchall says the working class was wrong to take on de Gaulle in the terrain of elections. Workers' unique strength lies in the workplaces, not in the ballot box. The whole context of electoral politics necessarily favors the right. So uh, what are the conclusions? Uh, Birchall has some brief conclusions here. Uh, what did May of 68 show us? It showed that even in a highly sophisticated advanced capitalist country, the working class has the power and potential to call the whole system into question. It showed how a mass strike penetrates into every sector of society and raises demands that go far beyond the confines of trade unionism to make questions of control of all of society central to the struggle. And finally, it showed that in the absence of a revolutionary leadership, reformism can regain control of even the most radical movement and pull it back into the framework of the existing order. 